this picture of Jesus. Nobody knows the power of God, what he's intending to do in a person's life. Hi, welcome to Crosstalk International. I'm Josh Weiss, and today we've got a good message for you talking about Hagar. I'm gonna hand things over to my dad here in a second, but first, let me give you a little background. Hagar was a slave woman that we read about in Genesis. She belonged to Sarah, Abraham's wife, and she had to go through some pretty rough things. Despite the fact that she was a slave, God saw her and worked in her life, and he can work in yours too. Maybe you can relate to Hagar on some level, I'm going to let my dad, Dr. Randy Weiss, take it from here. I encourage you to open your hearts and your minds to receive from this message. So I have a message for us today about Hagar. She had a beef with God. She uh, was feeling slighted. She was having a much worse day than I tend to have in a much worse day than anybody I know tends to have. Hagar understood jealousy and being marginalized. You can read all about it in Genesis chapter 21. When Hagar became pregnant with Abraham's son as a proxy for Sarah, instead of rejoicing and having a family celebration, Hagar fled in fear. Like any new expectant mother, hormones and uncertainty were certainly mixed with overwhelming emotions and hope. Things you can't always measure or even understand. But her hope was crushed by Sarah's dismay, as is sometimes the case when folks receive what they wanted, the result of gaining their requested outcome sometimes brings disappointment instead of satisfaction. You see, Sarah was barren. And she was unable to give her husband a child. And it was her idea to put her beloved servant Hagar into her husband's bed to gain a child through her property, as though she would somehow gain fruitfulness by proxy. She wanted to be fruitful, but she was unable. She could not produce naturally. She had no child. Instead, when her child by proxy was born, she saw Hagar's increase and her decrease. That's how she perceived it. But instead of sharing Abraham's fatherhood, she quickly became infuriated over her barrenness. Polygamy brings its own unexpected chaos. So does unfaithfulness, by the way, when others are invited into the bed reserved for marriage. Hagar met her rejection with fear, and Sarai had exploded at Abraham, accusing him. She said, it's all your fault. Sarai interpreted Hagar's joy of pregnancy and the pitiful sympathetic expression toward poor childless old Sarai as suffering abuse by her servant. Sarai didn't hesitate to turn her suggestion to Abraham and her instruction of her servant into, and what she said was, I put my maid in bed with you. And the minute she knows she's pregnant, she treats me like I'm nothing, says the modern translation from the message. Genesis chapter 16, verse 5. 
We'll never really know what happened, but the Bible tells us the outcome of how Sarah, Sarai at that time, before God changed her name, how she interpreted the events. But we know she became abusive to Hagar and, quote, Hagar ran away, unquote. But an angel of God, quote, found her beside a spring on the road, and Hagar was smart enough to know she couldn't survive long in the wilderness without water. And it was by the spring that the angel of God confronted her, said, Hagar, maid of Sarai, what are you doing here? And she said, I'm running away from Sarai. You know, that succinct little exchange left no room for misinterpretation. But the angel of God said, and I quote, Go back to your mistress. Put up with her abuse. And then he continued, I'm going to give you a big family. Children past counting. This was a promise made to Hagar promise made while she was feeling lost, alone, mistreated, abused. Everything about life was unfair. And the message from God came to give her hope. You may feel life is unfair. I'm confident God wants to bring you hope. Please listen. You see, it was then that Hagar was let in on God's plan to allow Hagar to become the mother of Ishmael, who would become the father of an entire multitude of people from the other side of Abraham's family. As God declared, her child's name would be Ishmael. I love the biblical narrative here in Genesis chapter 16. God named Hagar's son, but uniquely, Hagar named God. I'd never really noticed that before. In this rare instance, what the scripture says is, she answered God by name, praying to the God who spoke to her. You're the God who sees me. Yes, he saw me, and then I saw him. The Hebrew name for Hagar assigned to God is profound. el Roi, the God who sees me. And she did that because as she said, and I quote from Genesis chapter 16, 13, this is from the New International Version, I have now seen the one who sees me. She understood she was suddenly in a relationship with that God. You know, that God, the one who sees me. Realizing God sees us changes things. And that realization sent Hagar packing back to Abraham and Sarai. Now, fast forward years down the road, Ishmael became a rambunctious teenager. But the real news was that barren old Sarai had her own miracle. She became pregnant with Abraham's second son. Everything was perfect until Isaac was born and had become prince of the clan. It wasn't going to be perfect for Hagar or for Ishmael. You see, young Ishmael didn't treat baby Isaac with the respect that Sarai expected. The Bible says, One day Sarah saw the son that Hagar the Egyptian had borne to Abraham, poking fun at her son Isaac. And Sarah, whose name had now been changed after she had a child, Sarah reverted to the same response exhibited when Hagar became pregnant anger, and jealousy. It's a deadly combination. Hagar probably knew what was coming next. She'd had enough experience with 
anger and jealousy to know it was going to be a bad day. Sarah demanded of Abraham, quote, get rid of this slave woman and her son. No child of this slave is going to share inheritance with my son Isaac. And unlike Hagar's first exodus, when she fled voluntarily, this time Hagar was kicked to the curb. Abraham was brokenhearted. And he prepared some food and water for Hagar and his son, and then he sent her into the desert. What a scene. What pain. A father, a mother, a son. What pain. I assume it was very difficult for Abraham this time. When Hagar first ran away, he had no direct guilt for Hagar's personal choice to risk sojourning. She was going into a dangerous desert, but she went on her own. It was her choice. Even more distinct, at that time, fatherhood was simply an idea. Yes, his mistress was pregnant, but this time Abraham had invested years in raising and loving his son. Ishmael was a beloved son of a father who desperately had wanted a child. Ishmael wasn't a mere concept anymore. Abraham's love, his hope, his legacy had rested in Ishmael for many years. And after a very long childless life, Abraham had finally raised a son, someone to share his life. And although Isaac was certainly the, the joyous culmination of God's miraculous promise to Abraham and to Sarah, his love for Ishmael didn't evaporate with Isaac's birth. It's easy to ignore the emotional connection that certainly existed. Ishmael was a son to a father. Sarah must have been a, a very compelling woman because and this is going to sound odd, but even God chose to agree with her. In fact, God said plainly to Abraham, quote, do whatever Sarah tells you, unquote. Of course, God assured Abraham that his descendants would come through Isaac. But what about poor Hagar? Hated, rejected, marginalized again? Do you ever feel like poor Hagar? Do you ever feel like you just can't catch a break? She gave herself to Abraham at the insistence of her mistress, Sarah. And by the way, I'm assuming Hagar was kind of a hot young babe and Abraham was a withered old, wrinkly old guy. Sarah you know, Sarah and Abraham were kids. They were old. And Hagar probably didn't want a super old man to be her man. But she didn't have a choice. She was property. She was doing what she was told. And she carried Abraham's son. She helped raise his son. And she continued, literally, slaving away for Sarah. And then without warning, she was kicked to the curb. It was a bad day for this woman. We've all had bad days, but very few of us have been treated like Hagar. She was totally innocent. She hadn't slighted Isaac in any way. There's no record of her doing anything improper toward, toward Isaac. This was a childish act by her young son, Ishmael. And teenage boys can do things that their parents would prefer they didn't, but it doesn't necessarily stop them from doing it, says the guy who was a teenager and who raised six of them. Hagar was being exiled over something someone else did. It was not fair. 
And every one of us can look at things in life. And we can say, well, well, that wasn't fair. It's not nice. It's ugly. Do you ever feel like you're being treated unfairly? Have you suffered even though you were innocent? Hagar apparently forgot her very personal, profound experience from years earlier. It would have been good if perhaps Hagar had taken some notes along the way so she could look back and remember what she had experienced. Had she taken notes, she would have read what I read from her first experience. She had, quote, seen the one who sees me. God met her at her point of need, but her current struggle put her over at the top, and every one of us is subject to the same thing. Our current struggles can sometimes put us over the top. Abraham had sent mother and child into the unforgiving desert, but the one who sees me saw her in her plight, and he sees us too. We're gonna to take a short break. Like my dad says, God sees you, so don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Did you know that leprosy still exists? That's why a few years ago, we worked with World Missionary Evangelism to create a leper clinic here in India where we provide the medicines and food and the gospel on a daily basis. One thing we found was that the children of leper patients were contracting the disease as well because they get the disease through regular daily contact over long periods of time. So we worked with WME to create a children's home where the children of these leper patients could live nearby their family, but give them a hope and a future free of the disease. Would you consider sponsoring one of these children? Would you consider helping to give them a hope and a future? For just $25 a month, you can give that hope. You can provide that future. Less than a dollar a day. Give us a call at 1-800-688-3422. Welcome back. Let's resume talking about Hagar. At this point in the story, Hagar's child is a teenager and they're in the desert again, but not by their own choosing this time. Let's see what happens. Hagar and Ishmael had exhausted their meager supplies provided to, to them by Abraham. And after they reached the point of nearly dying of thirst, Hagar left her son to die under the shade of some bushes. She gave up all hope and she moved a distance away saying, quote, I can't watch my son die. But the one who sees me also hears me. God heard the boy crying and he told Hagar to go get the boy. Hold him tight. I'm going to make of him a great nation. That's from Genesis chapter 21. And then an absolutely amazing thing happened. And I will quote, Just then God opened her eyes. She looked. She saw a well of water. She went to it and filled her canteen and gave the boy a long, cool drink. What can compare to a long, cool drink when you're thirsty? I want to point out a fact that shouldn't elude us. God didn't create a well in the desert as a miracle. That's not what he did. He simply allowed Hagar to see his provision and reminded Hagar to hold her child tight. Hold her child tight tight. That's good advice for all of us. Sometimes everything we need is within our reach. It is simply beyond our vision. Hagar had given up. Really, all that she needed, everything was right there. All she had to do was look in the right place. Everything 
required to quench her thirst was right there. We all lose sight of God. At times we forget how much he loves us. We forget what he's done in the past to provide for us. We forget his goodness towards us. We forget his promises. We forget his love. We forget his covenant. We forget our own connection. And that should make us desperate. It's a blessing to be desperate when we forget those things because it will remind us of our deep need for God and how worthy he is and how well-equipped he is to provide for us. If we allow ourselves to be blinded by hopelessness, we can end up living or dying without hope. And that's so tragic. And it's so unnecessary. We don't have to be hopeless. We don't have to live like we're helpless because we have a helper. And if we fail to hold our loved ones tightly, we can end up thirsting alone and blaming God for our lack. Life isn't always fair. Some people are used and abused. It's sad that some folks are just cast away. At times it's due to thoughtless or careless or godless people or godless choices. But God is still El Roi. He still sees you. And if we pay attention, he is well able to open our eyes. Sometimes everything we need is within our reach simply beyond our vision. So develop a vision mindset. I want to give you some bullet points because these are bullet points that I need. So I'm just going to share my bullet points, the things I need with you because you may be like me and sometimes you may feel life is unfair. I want to always assume that God is real because he is. I want to always assume that God loves me because he does. He loves you. I want to always assume that he sees me and he sees you because he does. I want to always assume that God has a plan of rescue because I need rescue. Some of you maybe need rescue. And if you really need a miracle, I want to always assume that my God is able because I know he is and I have seen his miracles. I don't always see them exactly when I want them, but I have seen them and some of you have too. God is able. More likely, my deliverance and your deliverance is waiting upon our eyes to be opened to God's provision that may already be right there for us, but we just haven't seen it. So I will ask us to pray. Open our eyes, Lord. Help us to see. Grant us a long, cool drink of salvation. All of it and all that it includes. I want to read one last passage from Psalm chapter, uh, the 91st Psalm, verses 14 to 16 from the Message Translation. It's a paraphrase, but I think you'll love this. If you will hold on to me for dear life, says God, I'll get you out of any trouble. I'll give you the best of care if you'll only get to know and trust me. Call me and I'll answer. Be at your side in bad times. I'll rescue you and then throw you a party. I'll give you a long life and give you a long drink of salvation. So I want to wrap this up 
by asking you a question. To whom do you belong? Do you know? If, if you know the Lord and you love the Lord, you belong to him. You are his. We need to act like we know to whom we belong. We're not lost puppies without a collar and an ID tag. We're marked. We're marked by the God who loves us. And it means we're not alone and we're not forgotten. We're not rejected. We belong. We have a brand. What's your brand? I want to read just a few verses from the New Living Translation, Exodus chapter 13. It talks about a celebration, a festival. We're supposed to be people who party with the Lord. Festivals, celebrations to remember God's goodness. He spoke to them about having been redeemed from Egypt and, and had an annual festival. And it would be a visible sign to you like a mark branded on your hand or your forehead. This is not like the mark of the beast in the Revelation. This is something from God, like a mark branded on your hand or your forehead to remind you, let it remind you always to recite this teaching of the Lord. We're supposed to teach our children about our brand. They're supposed to know so they'll carry that brand. And this ceremony will be like a mark branded on your hand or your forehead. It is a reminder that the power of the Lord's mighty hand brought us out of Egypt. Thank you for being with me here today. I hope these words have had power and purpose in your life. And I hope you'll perhaps jot me a line and let me know that you're listening, watching, thinking, reflecting, and maybe you're taking your own notes about how God loves you and what he's doing in your life. Till next time, Shalom. What a great message. The one who sees you, hears you. You know, here at Crosstalk International, we're called to share the good news with people all over the world. If you've been touched by this message today, can I encourage you to look us up on social media? You can find us with the handle at Crosstalk TV. We have several more messages like this available for you 24 seven. And if you follow or subscribe to our channels, you'll never miss anything. If you'd like to support Crosstalk International, I'd ask you to pray about that. Give us a call, 1-800-688-3422. You can also reach us online at www.crosstalk.org. And of course, you can mail something by physical mail to P.O. Box 2528, Cedar Hill, Texas, 75106. Until next time, Shalom and God bless.